Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Joy, and I'm the worship and prayer pastor here, and it's a delight to be with you guys and to lead tonight's evening service. And also welcome to everybody online, and a special welcome if you're new here or visiting in any kind of way. Uh, we have little connect cards, all like QR codes at the back, and our welcome team who are going to wave at me. Hello, welcome team. You can see them. They've got these wonderful cards. You can kind of fill them in. You can find out a bit more about our church um, via them. And they're very friendly. Look at them smiling. They're wonderful. Thank you welcome team. Um, a couple of kind of little notices before some slightly exciting news. Uh, because basically, we have an APCM service, APCM service, APCM meeting even, um, coming up on Tuesday the 23rd, uh, which is not this Tuesday, it's next Tuesday. It's our church meeting and it's at 7.30. And so if you can come along, you'll find out lots about what's going on in our church, basically. Um, and some updates on various things like finances and staffing and all sorts of kind of stuff, really. So it's wonderful. If you have more, any more questions, I am probably not the person to ask. Lucy is much better at answering things. Oh, Andy's here as well, so I'm going to throw it at Andy. Andy no, knows loads about APCM, so that will be great. Also, coming up tomorrow, we have um, a really exciting event called Songs and Stories, uh, which is basically a time to kind of hear the songs and some of the stories behind um, some songs that have been written by myself and the worship team. And we're going to have a very relaxed evening. It's going to be very chill. It's going to be in here. There's no kind of pressure to sing the songs at all. You can come and listen, come and grab a drink at the bar. And if it's possible, please do sign up to a free ticket because I'd love to kind of know how many people roughly are coming. But there's quite a lot signed up, which I'm very excited. Um, so it's going to be a great evening. The last bit of news, which is terribly exciting, is we've got a couple of engagements recently. So... Give a round of applause to Jacob and Freya and Dave and Steph. <laughs> Woo! Very exciting. And you can ask Jacob and Freya and Dave and Steph after the service, I'm sure. Lots of questions. But there's loads to celebrate, and there's lots to celebrate, I'm sure, in all aspects of our lives. So let's stand together, and we're going to worship God. And I'm just going to read this psalm. So Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? the Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. And Lord, we, we seek your face tonight. We want to have open hearts that you may speak to us, you may move, you may transform us, you may transform this church more into your likeness, Jesus. So we come before you in worship, knowing that we're not perfect, knowing that we need you, we need your love, we need your grace but we thank you that there is so much in you that we can celebrate, we can adore, we can bow before tonight. So Holy Spirit, would you inspire us to worship you? Would you inspire us to worship Jesus, the risen King, the Lord of Lords? And would you come and fill this room with praise, with singing, with delight in you? We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. darkness we were waiting with our hope with our life till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets 
to a virgin king the world from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt oh, praise the father praise the son praise the spirit
Yeah, Jesus, we just pray that we would keep our eyes on you tonight, that we would keep our eyes above the waves, above the things that are going on, and that we would, we would bring these things to you, Lord. Maybe things that come up in our minds, whether we're out in our groups tonight or here in the service, would we be just offering these things to you, Jesus, but would we not be overwhelmed by them? We thank you, Lord, that we can fix our eyes on you, the author of salvation. We thank you that we are yours, that you are, my, that you are ours, that we are surrounded by your perfect love. We are held in your Father's hands. We thank you that you know each emotion that we're going through, every moment that's going to come up this week. We thank you that you care for it deeply. Would you help us to really fix our eyes on you and really make the most of this time we have together in your presence? pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat for a second. Thank you so much, guys. We're going to, in a second, have a little coffee break for a couple of minutes. We can grab a drink if you've not got one already. Um, but in a second, the youth um, and our amazing additional needs group trekkers are going to be heading out. So I'm just going to pray for them. So leaders, you might want to start doing whatever you want to do um, as I pray. So Father, thank you so much for our incredible ministries that happen here. Thank you for the youth. Thank you for our additional needs groups as well, Lord. Thank you that you care for each single person, that you love them deeply, that you have great things to share with them tonight. We pray they'd have great fun and um, really enjoy the times with others in their groups. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So if you're uh, trekkers, youth, do head out to your groups now and the rest of us are going to have a little coffee break. See you in a bit.
right. Hopefully you've had a little chance to grab a drink, but do come back to us, because I'm going to explain a slightly interesting, different way we're going to pray tonight. So grab your drinks quickly, come and grab a seat, and I will start to explain. So you might have just suddenly noticed the most observant amongst you tonight, that I've put a bit of a kind of throne here in the middle. And as we pray, there's an amazing passage in Hebrews, which I'm going to read, um, which talks about God being enthroned, or Jesus specifically. So in Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And as we, as we pray, we're not just praying just that God would help us in our time of need, but we're going to be praying for the world. We're going to be praying for Guildford. And the way in which we're going to do that tonight is I've got some little slips of paper. They're down the middle center aisles and there's some slips I think also for you guys on the side as well so you might want to pass them down and the thought was that you could write on either a simple personal prayer if you really want to or a prayer for the world and there's a little basket here just in front of this throne where we, when you're ready you can kind of come you can put the prayer in the basket as a, as a prayer before Jesus who is the great high priest who is enthroned by the right hand of the Father. And if you want to, there's a couple of prayer cushions here, which I don't, we don't often get the prayer cushions out, but I thought this is quite a nice moment just to kneel before Jesus if you want to. So once you put your prayer in the little basket, there's a time to kind of move and to pray there or just go and pray back in your seats and I'll wrap us up at the end. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Well, the, the microphone dipped then, didn't it? Great. Wonderful. Crack on.
And Jesus, we just lift these prayers to you. And would they be like incense rising to you, Lord? Would you hear our hearts? Would you hear the things that we've written? Would you move in our world? Would you move in Guildford? Would you move in our own lives, Lord? Help us to be faithful in prayer, to persevere even when we can't see change. Help us to know that you are always a faithful God and that your love is great and deep and wide. So Father, we give you these prayers. Thank you that Jesus is the great high priest on our behalf, that he hears us, he intercedes for us. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Amen to that prayer as well. We're going to um, hear from Mike Boddington, who's going to bring our reading. And I might just move, do a bit of stage, think, would you mind helping me, Lucy, move some of these cushions? <laughs> we'll move the throne as you read, Mike, but I'll pass you this. Thank you so much. The reading this evening is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Jesus is taken up to heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you, going at, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking at the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, good evening. Evening, how are we doing this evening? It's great, um, it's great to be with you and to be speaking on um, the ascension I, asked, um, I spoke to someone this morning, and they said that they, they've been a Christian for about 20 years. They'd never heard a sermon on the Ascension before. So maybe that's, um, that's you too. Now, in many churches, the, I think the reason for that is in, in, in many churches, the Ascension is a festival that takes place 40 days. Like we heard in the reading, it was 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. And if you work out the maths, 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead is not today. It is on a Thursday in about another three and a half weeks time. So Ascension always falls on a Thursday. And in some churches, they will do special services on that day to celebrate the Ascension. If you don't go to church on that, sun, on that Thursday, you may miss a celebrating or understanding or hearing anything about the Ascension whatsoever. So we are doing it a little bit early, but that is because I thought this is an important thing for us to kind of um, get to grips with, especially as we've been looking at walking with Jesus for the last few months. And this is actually the culmination, it's the end of Jesus' earthly life um, with us, with his disciples. But I don't know if you're like me, I find it quite an odd one. Has 
anyone think, else think this is kind of a, a bit of an odd thing? Not really sure about the ascension. What does it all mean? It seems a bit weird. And especially if we think about it as a sort of goodbye. Jesus was kind of doing, this was his kind of final speech, his farewell speech to his disciples. And he was saying goodbye to them. I don't think anyone likes goodbyes. Does anyone like goodbyes? Maybe if you're super introverted and you're like, it's the end of a long day and I've had enough of people, then you really like goodbyes. But for most of the time, especially if it's someone that we're particularly fond of, and it's particularly if we know it's going to be a final goodbye, those can be really traumatic, really upsetting times, can't they? I don't know if you can think of a time in your life you've had to say a final goodbye. But this was a final goodbye, and it feels like if we're, if we're supposed to be celebrating it, it feels like we're kind of being cajoled into it. Like, please be happy about this thing that's actually quite sad. And I wonder if that's how the disciples felt. Jesus was leaving them. How are they actually going to have felt in those moments? Maybe they wished Jesus wasn't gone up into heaven, that he'd stuck around um, to be physically with them. If you, um, if you know the story when Jesus, uh, Jesus is risen from the dead, in, in John's gospel, it describes how Thomas was one of the disciples who wasn't with the other disciples on that kind of first Easter evening. He didn't see Jesus and he didn't believe them that Jesus had risen from the dead. He said, I'm not going to believe until I actually see him physically. I can put my hands in his scars. I can touch them for myself. I need that. And, and Thomas is really lucky because he got to experience that, didn't he? A week later, Jesus meets with him and Thomas gets to see that for himself. And he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus replies to him, yes, that's great for you, Thomas. But more blessed are those who will believe without seeing. And that's us, isn't it? We don't get to see Jesus physically with us. Thomas did. And Jesus calls us blessed. But I don't feel blessed for it because sometimes believing without seeing is hard, isn't it? We have our moments, we have our doubts. And maybe we're like the disciples, we think maybe it would be better if Jesus physically stuck around with us. But he didn't, he ascended. And there are a few things that I want to draw out of this story as to why I think it is actually worth celebrating and it is good news. So you're ready for this. So three things. First of all, um, the first piece of good news is that this is really, really obvious perhaps, but where Jesus is, Jesus is in heaven. And this is good news. And it seems obvious, but we need to kind of clarify and we need to go into a little bit more detail about what's going on here. Because the passage we just heard read for us from the book of Acts, right at the beginning of the book of Acts. So it's Luke who wrote the book of Luke, and then he also wrote a sequel, the book of Acts. This is kind of, this is the only passage that's in both books, actually. He talks about the ascension in Luke. He goes into a bit more detail in the book of Acts. And in Acts, he explains how Jesus has gone up into heaven. That's where Jesus has gone. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what we say when we kind of say our creeds um, in church together. So where is Jesus? Jesus is in heaven. But it gets a little bit more complicated than that. In, in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says this. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. And that's not just true um, when Jesus was physically um, walking the earth. That is true now. So if Jesus is in heaven, he is also where two or three are gathered in my name. And in John's gospel, Jesus says that both he and the Father will come and make their home in those who love him. So where exactly is Jesus? And where exactly is heaven? Is it a place up there? kind of in the sky with fluffy clouds and harp music? Is heaven just the place we go to when we die? And if this is the case, how can Jesus be both there and here with us when we worship this evening? How can he be close to us, making his home with us as he promised to when he has gone so far away? And I don't know what you uh, think of when you, when you picture heaven, when you think about heaven, when you think about kind of life after death. I don't know if you've thought about these kinds of things before. Um, but what Jesus' ascension actually means does play into our understanding of heaven and vice versa. And I think a lot of what we think about when we say heaven doesn't come from 
actually from the Bible. It doesn't come from Christian understanding, Christian beliefs, Christian tradition. It comes from um, the Greeks. I love the Greeks. It comes from the Romans. They had a whole mythology that was built up around very specific ideas about what the afterlife looked like. And actually, our Christian tradition has kind of been caught up in some of those um, teachings as well. So we've been inherited this kind of mishmash of understandings when it comes to heaven. And so that can leave us feeling very confused, or it can lead, leave us feeling a bit kind of not sure um, what to think and just fill in the blanks for ourselves. Because actually, the Bible doesn't say that much about heaven, believe it or not. It doesn't say a huge amount about heaven. And so I was a bit confused about this until a few years ago, I read um, a great book by Tom Wright. I'm sure many of us have read some of his books, but uh, one book in particular called Surprised by Hope did some really helpful work for me in, in kind of understanding, laying out some groundwork about what heaven is, but also, and I think almost more importantly, what heaven is not. And this shaped my understanding, and I'd love to share a few kind of, of the insights that I gl gleaned from this with you this evening. So let's go for three or four things first that heaven is not. First, it is not. When you Google heaven, you get pictures like this. Lovely. Pictures like this come up. Anyone else ever? I don't know if you I used to be an RE teacher. I Googled heaven quite a lot, and we, we looked at art and religion. Anyway, it's a whole thing. What heaven is not, it is not a place up there, way beyond the sky. In, in, in Acts, we do have this account or this visual description of Jesus going up into the clouds. And I think we've kind of run with that. We've made that too literal. It was kind of a, meant to be a metaphor to help us understand. We've taken it too far. Heaven is not, there we go, big cross through it. Heaven is not a place up there, a faraway place beyond the sky. Heaven is also not a kind of escapist dream. It's not a place that we can kind of just drift off to once we die and just want everything here to just be over and get rid of it all and, and like escape to some faraway place that's different. And the other thing heaven isn't, heaven isn't a carrot to be dangled in front of us to, to behave ourselves. Some people talk about that. And, and certainly in the past, Christians have been very guilty of this, of, of saying behave yourself, do the right thing, don't mess up, blah, 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 perform X, Y, and Z, do all the good things that you're supposed to do, because if you don't, you won't go to heaven, and if you behave yourself, you get to go to heaven when you die. That's not really what heaven is either, and another thing heaven is not, is not a state of mind that we can enter into here and now, just with positive energy and good thoughts. And I don't know if you know people who kind of talk about heaven like that. I certainly do. But that, again, is not what heaven is. If heaven, so if heaven isn't all of those things, what is it? What is helpful? You were like, okay, great, Lucy, but what actually is it? Where am I going to go from here? Well, Tom Wright talks about this, and he talks about how heaven, what heaven is, is God's space. That's what heaven is. It's God's space. It meets with our space. It meets with our space, our earthly space. But it's greater than our space. It's more than that. It's kind of, if you, if you like to work in dimensions, it's like another dimension of our world. And we get glimpses of heaven. We get glimpses of this heavenly dimension. When we, when we see an incredible view, a beautiful sunset it might be, when we experience deep peace, when we see acts of selfless love, because all of these things are like windows into God's space, heaven, God's kingdom. Heaven is this extra dimension. It's the God dimension of our present reality. And God who lives in heaven is present to us. He's present with us in the ups and downs, the highs and lows of our lives. And God longs for the day when the whole of creation will come together and will perfectly reflect everything that is true in heaven, that it would also be true on earth. And so the good news of Jesus' ascension is that he hasn't gone way up there, way beyond the stars into space. You know, in the, in the Cold War, the Americans and Russians were having this competition as to who could um, get an astronaut to space first. Russian, Russia won that race. There was another race America won later on. But they won that race. And, and, and what they did was they, they sent an astronaut up they, who saw Earth from the for the first time from up there in, in outer space. 
And they came back and, they, and, and the Rus Russians said as a result of this, we went into space, we didn't find God, God does not exist. It's a very simple way of understanding it. And that's not what we believe as Christians. We don't believe that God is up there in outer space. And we don't believe that that's where Jesus went. But we actually believe that Jesus went into this dimension, this God dimension, this God reality, heaven, right, that is right here and right now, is a present reality. And that one day these two dimensions will come together. The kind of curtain, the separation between the two will end and they will be brought into this multi-dimensional reality here and now. So Jesus ascends not far away, but into God's dimension. And he becomes as near to us as breath itself. He, he comes so very near to us that he is present with us when we gather. He is in our hearts through our faith. He comforts us when we grieve. He shares our joys and sorrows. He is not somewhere remote. That's not where he's gone. He's ascended into heaven to become more present with us than he could ever possibly be. That's good news. Jesus is in heaven. Secondly, Jesus has ascended. He's ascended as a Lord and as God and as King. And in his ascension, Jesus, I already said this, Jesus returns to the right hand of the Father. And in some kind of art, you will see kind of this old man with Jesus sitting at his right hand. And, and again, it's not supposed to be literal language. It's a metaphor. It's a picture because we don't worship two gods. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God. Jesus and the Father are one. They are they are the same. So for the disciples, the ascension, what it did was it made sense of everything that had come before. If you imagine the disciples, they had been with Jesus for a good few years. They caught glimpses of who Jesus was. They'd seen him do incredible miracles. They'd heard him teaching, him teaching incredibly, um, incredibly profoundly about who he was and how life was in God's kingdom. And at moments they thought, oh, yes, actually, I think Jesus is the chosen one. Then they saw him die and rise again, and they thought, gosh, I think Jesus is really powerful and very special indeed. But it was in his ascension that he, they begin to see fully how Jesus is Lord and God and worthy of worship and praise. And that's great, but actually it came with an additional level of meaning in Jesus' time because the disciples lived in a context, they lived in the Roman Empire. And to declare that someone was Lord and God had political implications because only Caesar could be declared to be Lord and God. And only ultimate loyalty and obedience and allegiance should be paid, should be paid to him alone, not to anyone else. So to call someone else Lord, to call someone else God, to call someone else worthy of ultimate loyalty would have been dangerous and costly. And the disciples knew that in their later lives, most of them were martyred. Most of them gave their lives for loyalty to Jesus, loyalty to him being Lord alone. It cost them everything. And I wonder, what about you and me? What does it cost us? If we declare Jesus to be Lord, what does that mean? How does that um, impact our lives? How does it cause us to make a sacrifice as well? We live um, in, in our society, in our country, we're very lucky because we are not expected, thankfully, to give our ultimate um, allegiance, our ultimate loyalty to our political leaders. We are lucky. We can question our political leaders. We can critique them. That is not the case in every country in the world, even now. So our society doesn't expect us to pay our ultimate loyalty to our, politi our po political leaders, but it d does ask us to give our allegiance to other things. And I wonder what things you can think of our society asks us to give our loyalty to. Are you asked to give your loyalty, your attention, your time, your honor, your kind of, your sense of self and being to your being young, being beautiful, being wealthy, having a family, being successful, being powerful, Whatever it is, fill in your own blank. There are lots of things, lots of ways that our society asks us to give loyalty to something other than Jesus. But I tell you what, it's only loyalty to Jesus and the 
different way of being in the world that that loyalty brings us, that opens us up to this much more satisfying, much more captivating way of being in the world. It's only loyalty to Jesus that can bring us wholeness and healing and freedom and peace. Loyalty to anything else just won't cut it. And so Jesus ascends as Lord, and that is good news. And part of the good news is that it means that you and I are not Lord. We are not God, and we don't have to be in charge. And I'm quite glad about that because you might be like me. I mess up a lot. I am flippant. I am fickle. And I'm really glad that I am not God, even though at times I might try to be God of my own life. And our Lord Jesus is so unlike us because he never is greedy, he never rejects, he's never selfish, he never chooses anything but love. He is the one who's risen and ascended and enthroned and he will one day reign over all things with peace and justice and mercy and love. And you know, that reign is such good news because it is so different from the empires of the world around us. The um, the emperor um, Napoleon, who lived you know, two, what, over 200 years ago, he said that all the great empires of the world have depended on force and violence. We see what happens to those empires. They fall, they, they crush, they crumble, they, they bring people down with them, they destroy. But that is not the way of this empire. This is not the way of this kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. Because what it is, is it's a kingdom of love and peace and reconciliation and sacrifice. And that is the lordship that we come under when we say Jesus is king, Jesus is lord. So that's the second thing, that Jesus is ascended as lord and king. And the third thing I'd love us to consider is the legacy of Jesus' ascension, the legacy. And I was was preparing to speak this week, and I noticed in Acts chapter 1 something I hadn't seen before, something I'd never really noticed or never really paid attention to before, and that's in verse 6. If you've got your Bible with you, and I'll I'll put it up on screen, and that's um, this verse um, just here. The disciples say to Jesus, is this? Is this the time you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's quite a weird weird thing to say, but just to give you a bit of context. This is another case of the disciples getting the wrong end of the stick, just to to put it out there. They had done this so much um, before Jesus died. They thought that Jesus was going to give them positions of honor and prestige. They thought Jesus was going to crush their opposition, that he was going to destroy the Roman Empire, that he he was going to act with power and force and might and military strength. They thought all of these things, and they got really upset and confused when it didn't go that way, and Jesus instead died on a cross and rose from the dead. They got it wrong a lot. And the risen Jesus clearly knew that they were still not doing a great job of getting it right because he stuck around with them for 40 days after he rose from the dead. He stuck around to prepare them, to help teach them and help get them ready for what life would be like once he had physically gone from their presence. And they still don't get it. They still think, you can see from this verse here, they still think even at this point, that the mission of Jesus is about restoring a political system that they used to have. You'd have thought things would have clicked by, um, by now for them. You'd have thought that Jesus and his mission would have been made clear to them, that they would have realized the kingdom of God is not about establishing a political reality, but working in the lives of Jesus' followers to bring about a kingdom of justice and right living, not through power and coercion, but love and sacrifice. But no, they still don't get it. Right up, Jesus is about to ascend. I wonder what he was thinking. Oh my gosh, maybe I need to give them another 20 days. I don't know. But he, he's about to ascend and they still don't get it. They still think, right, what we really want, Jesus, is for things to go back to how they used to be. And the good old days, the glory days, right back then when this happened and that happened. And whether that was a truth or whether that was a kind of a myth that they had been, they taught themselves or they'd been taught by other people, that's what they really were asking for. That's what they really wanted. 
And we can look at the disciples and go, they're a bit stupid. Maybe they were. But I wonder if there is, there is a reality of that for you and me too. That we also want Jesus to make things like they used to be. The good old days. Back when we were young and naive and everything, life was great. Or back even further when our, our elders, our, our grandparents, our ancestors, they tell us, oh, life was so much simpler back, back then, back in the day. But that's not what Jesus is about. That's not how Jesus works. What Jesus does is far more powerful because what he does is he gives them a gift. He promises to give them this gift that will empower them to live in the present moment and the present moment being one where they will need to have this gift, the gift of the Spirit, to do all that they are being called to do. So these still don't get it disciples were entrusted with Jesus' legacy to complete his mission and given this spirit to do that. And we're given the same spirit. We, we celebrate Pentecost as a church, but actually that is not just about celebrating a day in the church's calendar. God gives us his spirit. Jesus leaves us as Christians with his spirit. Even those of us who mess up, who walk backwards, who get it wrong, who are confused, Jesus gives us his spirit. And through this gift, we have all that we need to navigate the world we live in with the truth and the beauty and the goodness and the peace and the grace. Not just that is the best of ourselves, but that Jesus himself had. That's the gift. What an incredible gift. And Jesus also promises that he will be with us. He'll be with us always. He's not far away. He's present with us. He knows what's going on in our world, and he knows what it's like to be human, because he is human, and we can ask him, and we can trust him with confidence. So that's the ascension. It is good news. Jesus has ascended into heaven so that he can be close to us forever. He has ascended as Lord and God because his way is a good way, and his kingdom is a good kingdom that brings us freedom and healing and peace. And it's good news that he ascended because he left us his spirit and he empowers us to go and be like him in the world, to do what he did and to bring his kingdom. And as we kind of draw um, this, to, uh, this to a close, what I'd love us to do um, this evening is to respond um, by saying together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Now, you might not know what the Apostles' Creed is or you might not have come across it for a while the Apostles' Creed is, is a doctrine, is a set of beliefs that, um, that goes right back two millennia to those first um, disciples and apostles. And it is a doctrine that's saying, this is what we believe. This is what unites us, not just here at St. Saviour's this evening, but with Christians all around the world for 2,000 years. This is what unites us. This is what we believe to be true about um, Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read this. If we do declare ourselves to be Christians, we're going to read this confidently. And as we do that, let's consider how these truths, how these things that we believe about God, about Jesus, might shape us and form us into being the people that he has called us to be. So if we're up for it, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. The words are going to come up on the screen and we're going to say them together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Joy. Thank you so much, Lucy. There's so much for us to kind of reflect on as we continue to worship, which is the response we will have tonight is we're going to sing a couple of songs to kind of, as we're kind of going towards the end of our service. But as we worship, let's worship God, knowing that he's our Lord, 
He's our saviour, he's our God, he is king. Um, so I'm going to simply hand over to Dave and the team and we're just going to worship. is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me shaking I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus he's never Faithful through 
Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. And we give you the breath in our lungs as we go out this week. Would you, uh, would you be praised? Would you be worshipped in every moment, every conversation? We give you our lives. We give you the whole of ourselves. Help us when we fall down. And thank you that your grace is always sufficient in our weakness, Lord. But we want to fix our eyes on you, knowing that your love is so much greater for us, for the world, for the people around us in our lives. Would you help us to honor you, to love you as our Lord, our Savior, our King? Would you help us understand that reality more this week? Jesus, we worship you, we adore you. We just give you ourselves again. Help us to come to you each day, just giving you simply ourselves, simply saying that you are Lord over our lives. Would you nudge us by your spirit? Would you lead us? Would you guide us? Holy Spirit, come and re refresh us, refill us, empower us. Will we be bold? Will we be courageous in the world? Will we show your love, your grace, your kindness to others? Will we welcome those who are on the edges, maybe those who are overlooked? Would we be your disciples wherever we go? Come and use us. We thank you that we can be together today, but you're going to scatter us tomorrow. And would you gather us back again on Sunday and in our life groups and our other places where we can just be together. But Father, thank you that you do send us out into the world to show your good news, to tell of your good news. So would you use us? We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat for a second. I just have one simple little notice, um, which is um, if you'd like to give at all towards the ministry at St. Saviour's, to everything that happens here in this building, but also our amazing mission partners, then there is a wonderful giving station at the back of church, I think hiding behind over there at the moment. Um, or you can give online as well. We are very, very grateful for all that you give um, to the ministry that God is doing here. But I'm going to send, say a little... I'm going to say a little final final prayer as we go out and um, we can enjoy the evening. So Father, thank you so much for this time. We pray that you send us out in the power of your spirit and we pray that we would, um, with your love, love the world, love the people we meet really, really well this week. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good night. <laughs>